Welcome. In this edition, we'll talk with the parents of Earl Faison, who will talk publicly for the first time about the questionable circumstances of their 27-year-old son's death while in police custody in Orange, New Jersey. Before that talk, however, we note of the passing of one of the important figures in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. James Farmer, founder and former head of the Congress of Racial Equality, died at 79 years of age on July 9th. For his long struggles to right wrong in this nation, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor last year. Mr. Farmer's activism predates the emergence of Dr. King, Rosa Parks, and many others. Despite having earned a degree in theology at Howard University, he decided against the ministry and opted instead for civil rights involvement. Mr. Farmer organized the historic Freedom Rides, where students from across the nation challenged racial segregation and interstate busing. The youngsters were just captivated by the thought that by their very bodies, by offering their lives, their blood, they were going to bring a better day for their children. Uh, it was that kind of spirit. They were in the leadership of a movement which was going to change things for their people. That's where the strength came from. I had just joined the staff of CORE as national director. We decided that the thing to do uh, was to force the United States government, the federal government, to enforce the Supreme Court decision. And the only way we could see to do that was to create a crisis situation. We deliberately sought to create a crisis situation, using the media to uh, feeling that um, the government would act to enforce our rights only if we made it more dangerous politically for them not to act. And uh, that's what we tried to do. We, and we counted on the Bull Connors and the George Wallaces and others helping us to do that by helping us create the crisis. What they were going to do was to board buses, Greyhound and Trailways. The whites would sit in the back of the bus. The blacks would sit in the front of the bus. And they would refuse to move if ordered to move. At every rest stop, they would leave the bus and the blacks would go into the waiting rooms labeled for white. This is through the Deep South. And the whites would go into the waiting rooms labeled for blacks. They would refuse to leave if ordered, and they would accept the consequences of their action. If it meant jail, if it meant beating, if it meant death. Uh, those kids, and they were SNCC and CORE kids at this point, I looked in their faces and I saw terror, wild terror, but I saw something else. I saw a determination to do what they thought had to be done in spite of the fear. James Farmer risked his own life several times. He told of one occasion in Louisiana. We're still segregated. We're still segregated. I had to escape from a lynch mob. It was made up of state police and others of what they call rednecks, people from the surrounding areas who had been brought in, had been given uniforms, deputized, given uniforms, electric cattle prods, uh, clubs, uh, guns, and tear gas. When uh, this mob, mostly in uniform, was screaming through the streets of Plaquemine, yelling for my blood. Uh, this was an unusual lynch mob. It, uh, Come on out, farmer, we're gonna get you. When we get that so-and-so nigger, we're gonna kill him. They're kicking open doors in the black community, uh, searching for me. Unable to find me in one house, they throw in tear gas bombs and move to the next house and kick open doors. They, they, it was a screaming mob. And I was with uh, about 200 other blacks, first in the church, when they discovered the church, uh, that the crowd was there. They attacked the church and tear gassed it. We then ran to the parsonage, which was next door, the minister's home. And they then tear gassed that, breaking every window, tear gas canisters coming in, forced us out. We finally sent um, one of the young black corps members crawling through high grass to get to a mortuary, a black-owned funeral home, to ask the woman mortician if uh, we could seek refuge there. She said yes, so we crawled through high grass, got into this home. They soon discovered we were there and besieged us there, screaming for my blood. Well, two black uh, ex-Marines worked out an escape route for me then because uh, I started to go out and face uh, officers of this mob, say, you're looking for me, I'm farmer, and, you know, utter stupidity. 
Uh, and they, the uh, blacks with me, realized that, and they put their hands over my mouth and pulled me back into the house and said, you're not going out there, Jim, tonight. If you go out there tonight, you won't be alive tomorrow morning. Uh, we said, that's a lynch mob, baby. They worked out an escape route using the two hearses that this uh, funeral director had in the basement. One hearse was sent out with just a driver as a decoy to open up roadblocks that the mob had set up, searching every car that left the town looking for me. And they succeeded in pulling the troopers away from one of the roadblocks because they assumed I must be in there. And uh, they gave chase to the hearse uh, the hearse, um, through its short wave, called back to the funeral home and said, Roadblock A has been opened up. They are pursuing us. I was then put in the back of uh, the second hearse, and we shot at high speed right through that roadblock, which had been deserted, uh, with me lying down in the back of the hearse. Uh, I expected to die that night. 